Welcome to the September 17th Hadley Public Schools School Committee meeting. Uh, is there a motion to call the meeting to order? So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Here we are. We've started the school year. Yay! Wow. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Looks like we made it. <laughs> Looks like we made it. That's right. It sounds like a song, Humera. <laughs> Indeed it is. <laughs> All right. Are there any adjustments to the agenda tonight? None. No. Okay. I didn't see any going no. All right. Um, <laughs> let's open it up then for public comment. Again, uh, if you would like to make public comment, please uh, raise your digital hand. I can call on you. Um, you can come off mute. Uh, we will adhere to the public comment policy we have been adhering to regarding um, topics, uh, process, and timing. And if you are unable to raise a digital hand, uh, just come off of mute and indicate your desire to speak in public comment, please. I'll give it a few moments for folks to make that indication. I'm not seeing anything yet. Okay. Um, seeing none, I am going to move forward with uh, presentations and discussion items. Fall athletics. Uh, Mr. Sudnick. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Dr. McKenzie, I'm able to share my screen, correct? You allowed me to do that? Oh. I'm going to make that happen right now. All right, not a problem. Making that happen. Not a problem. So in a second, mm -hmm. um, I will share the updates that we had for the fall athletics program. We've had a few changes that we've made um, since I last met and chatted with you about it. And I'd uh, just like to quickly update uh, the school committee on uh, the latest and greatest of what's going on with fall athletics and uh, decisions that we've not only made as a district, but as a group of athletic directors in the Franklin County group who we are matched up with for this fall, so. You are co-host now, Eric, but I do not see your screen yet. Oh, yeah, I haven't put it up yet. Sorry, I, okay. I was waiting for, for the signal. All right, can everyone see my screen now? There we go, yes. All right, excellent. So there's just six points um, that I'll go through as far as updates and major changes to the fall athletic um, events going on. Um, I'm actually going to just touch on six because I don't have anything further from it down below in my, in my paragraphs or my notes. So, and that is just the, the removal of the field hockey club is an option for Hopkins athletic students at, uh, at this time because Smith Academy is not going to be hosting athletics this fall. So that was completely removed from the fall athletic um, plan. So the five remaining things that I will touch on, um, fall one versus fall two for, for soccer, uh, number two opponents for inter interscholastic competition, uh, point number three, transportation, both school and parent-based. Number four, spectators at home events, uh, actually away events. And number five, contact tracing at events. So as far as point number one, so, uh, fall one versus fall two for soccer season. Originally, we were looking at hosting soccer as a fall one sport, um, along with cross country and golf. When we decided to regionalize our opponents, and play only the Franklin County teams in our athletics this fall. Uh, we ran into an issue in the fact that no other schools in Franklin County were going to be hosting their fall or their soccer programs this fall. So we had to make the decision to move that to a fall two, to the fall two season, and instead offer clinics uh, or and our trainings at the school provided by the coaching staff for this fall. So we're limiting the number of events they're going to do two trainings uh, a week, both for the boys and the girls program, seven to 12. And it'll go from tomorrow all the way up until October 30th. So um, the competitive interscholastic athletic season will be played in the fall two season and that February 22nd, I believe off the top of my head, to the April 25th timeline. And uh, we'll see what our opponent schedule would look like as far as that's concerned, depending on a, a number of things that would happen between now and then. So, 
moving along, another update. Let me move this so I get to my scroll bar here. All right. Uh, the scheduled opponents and travel. Um, that's simply been updated to reflect that indeed we will only be playing the Franklin County Athletic teams this fall. Um, Smith Volk would have been included. I'm sorry, Smith Academy would have been included in that group, but they're not hosting athletics this fall. So these are the teams we will be playing in um, golf and cross country as far as interscholastic athletic events. Um, I had spoke about the fact that we were leaning that way at the last school committee meeting I presented at, but now it is finalized and we've uh, established schedules. So as far as away games and transportation, we're still looking to provide transportation to the all, all the athletic events at uh, for the interscholastic events. Um, we did update the athletic plan just to notify um, parents and students that went on the bus that the um, the students would be three feet apart instead of the typical six feet and just, you know, with as you get in a closed space with the proximity, there is a, a likelihood of increased transmission. So just as a note. Um, but on the same note, we also decided to create a, uh, a form for students to be transported by themselves or their parents if they chose to go that route in anticipation of using school transportation. Uh, we posted it on the district website under the athletics webpage. Um, and you can find it on this link here uh, to provide families an option if that's the way they chose to transport to events for this fall. Moving on. Um, so we were, we've been doing a lot of discussion in the Franklin County Athletic Directors Group regarding how we would handle spectators this fall. And we came to the decision that at, at, at all home events, uh, we weren't going to allow spectators uh, for any home events regardless of the event. Um, wasn't an easy decision, but based off of a myriad of factors, we decided to go in that direction. Uh, we as the Franklin County Athletic Director Group did craft a letter, um, as you can you find on this link here, uh, stating those expectations. It will not affect, that decision will not affect us as much because we're not hosting the soccer competitions this fall, but it would affect uh, spectators regarding golf and cross country. So the expectation will be just um, staff members who are going to help run the event, any officials if necessary, and both the home and away team. So to try and minimize the amount of people at an event and stay in, um, just make sure we're following the state guidelines, limiting 50 people to one site for an event. So it was really the driving force behind uh, the decision to not do, not have spectators at events for this fall. So moving along, um, with the fact that we were not going to have spectators at um, our home events for this fall, um, we just modified the contact tracing. Uh, it was essentially shortened and just modified to show that we'll be tracking the athletes, the coaching staff, game officials, and game personnel attending. Uh, we removed a section regarding tracking spectators and things of that nature. Um, with the decision to uh, not allow spectators to attend events, I am looking to work with Hadley Media um, for not only this fall, but any time that we would look to make a, um, a decision regarding no spectators at games, to film the games and at the very least have them posted on the Hadley Media site. We do that for the, the home basketball games, for all the varsity home basketball games. People seem to really enjoy it. And I know it would be disappointing the fact that people were not able to witness in person uh, the games, but at least they could be able to, to view them if we were able to tape them and get them posted online. So that is the series of updates as it stands. Um, at this point, if anyone is heading, has any questions, I'd be more than happy to, to answer them to the best of my ability. Thanks, Eric, for the update. Um, and yeah, I know that this is obviously, you know, changes as uh, uh, it's impacted by other districts and their involvement um, and, you know, who is part of that competition. So much appreciated on uh, the latest on where we are with um, the fall sports. You're welcome. So Eric, this is Paul. Uh, thanks for the clarity there. So if someone, uh, say soccer, doesn't, um, practice this fall 
does that affect anything of how they play in the spring? Are they, nope. I guess the question is, are they obligated to practice this fall? No, these are completely optional. They're being provided by the school to enhance um, the fall experience, right, to get athletes back and moving. Um, this is not considered their competitive season. Um, so there's no obligation to go to every single training, any or all trainings, and it would not affect their standing as far as a member of the soccer team in the spring. One okay. of the things that our coaches are expected to, one of the guidelines our, expo our coaches are expected to follow, regardless of any season, is out of school or out of season uh, participation of any kind should not impact in season participation um, or the student standing on the team. Coaches are supposed to treat student athletes uh, the same, uh, regardless of what they did in the off season. It's who shows up on the first day of the season and how they fit in in their role on the team for that specific season. So, but great question. Yeah, thanks. Yep, you're welcome. Any other questions from the committee? And hi, Tara, I saw you joined us. All right. Uh, thank you, Eric. Looking forward to hearing more from you over the fall. All right. Thank you very much for your time today. Everyone have a great evening. Thanks, you too. Um, okay, we're going to move to Hadley Kids plan and rates. Yes, yeah, so I will share. The plan is something the school committee had reviewed previously at a previous meeting. I really am going to focus on the rates and remind people of when uh, they can expect Hadley kids or after school to be open. Um, let me share the screen. So assuming, and this is up to the school committee, assuming that the um, we progress through the phases as we anticipate, uh, we have in-person learning available to all students. The first day in-person learning is available to all students is the first day of Hadley kids. So that could be the earliest that would be is October 26th, I believe is the Monday. Um, and given the fact that we have shortened days, again, Hadley Kids in these documents, I will add a link to this folder. Um, it was added in, I think the last newsletter and I will add it again in this letter. So people, all these documents are public. They're in the superintendent messages folder in my drive, which means anybody can access them are public documents. Hadley Kids has done a wonderful job of setting up a plan, of walking through how many students would be in a cohort, making sure that we adhere to the things that are really critical, mask wearing, physical distancing, keeping students um, in small groups, and trying to match cohorts as much as possible. The big difference is that uh, students will start at one and parents will have the option of picking up children um, at the, the last year it was two and a half hours from 3 to 5 30 so students could do a pickup at 3 30 or they could do a pickup at 5 30 and if students if parents opt to do a pickup at 5 30 uh, the rate is 25 dollars per day and if they do the pickup at 3 30 it's 14 dollars per day 14 dollars per day has been the rate it had the kids for a long 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 time so that hasn't changed this just takes into consideration additional operating expenses that we will incur by extending the program by two hours if parents choose to extend the program by two hours. Parents can, as you can see by the enrollment, which is on the screen, parents can determine which days they need the program. And we also will allow families to say what time they need to leave. So they don't need to pick the same time every single day so we can uh, we just need to have a sense somewhat of a sense uh, perhaps to the best of their ability about every month is when we kind of do adjustments to schedules I think is what Sarah Frost is looking for so I wanted in this case a change because rates fees are something that the school committee has to approve and vote on so what needs to be approved here is not the, the plan per se, it's in line with the district reopening plan, but it's that there's a new fee or a new rate for parents who require care from one until 5.30. Happy to answer any questions. Any questions about the plan or the, the updated rate here, taking into account the additional time? 
I just have a quick question, and that is sure. the uh, shorter amount of time, the $14 per day per child, is that about equivalent to what it was pre-pandemic? Oh, it hasn't changed since in years. I think it's been $14 a day since I've worked here. So it's uh, honestly, I, I don't think, yeah, it, even when it was private, it would have run by the nonprofit. That rate has not changed. So all we've done is add uh, roughly, you know, more or less kind of a per hour rate to the, to the back end. Great. Thank you. And to be clear, Annie, you said that this won't start until at the earliest, October 23rd? It's the 23rd of Friday. I'm sorry, it's the Monday that students would come back. So the first day, the easiest way to say it is Hadley Kids becomes available when 100% of students have the option of attending school if they choose. That's the day. Hadley Kids does not start before that. Yeah, October 26th is what's cited at the top of this plan. No earlier than. Well, that could be that. Hopefully I read the calendar correctly. It's the Monday after the six-week period. I just have a quick question. Do we do we know, do we have enough interest in um, people staffing it this year? Uh, we are not concerned about that right now. We do, we have had interest in it, so we're not concerned that we, we won't have enough staffing. As a matter of fact, we have had folks reach out to us. Mm -hmm. And we're very grateful that a lot of our Hopkins students are often um, eager to staff Hadley Kids as well. Okay. Um, so this is the this is an action item for us to approve um, the Hadley kids rates for fiscal year 21. If there are no further questions, is there a motion to approve these rates? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next is the Hadley Elementary School Handbook. Ms. Dowd. Hi. Hello again. Nice to see everybody. Um, yeah, so welcome. And um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Am I allowed to do that, Annie? I believe so. Yes, I think you're a co host. You should be able to. Okay. You should be able to. Let me know if it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. I'll be so glad when this is when I'm not when it's different again. <laughs> um, I want to make sure I have it. Okay. So what I'd like to share with you all is just the summary page. You guys received this um, about two days ago. I'm sure you're all very, very busy as we all are at the start of school trying to manage everything. So we do have our summary page um, and right here is just what we've changed and why. Our changes are pretty minimal this year. Um, I know um, April Camuso had a lot of work to do with her handbook. Ours has been tweaked um, the past two years that I've um, been working here. Um, going on to my third year. So the handbook looked pretty good. Um, there were a couple things that we needed to adjust around spelling and grammar, um, just some capitalization, very minimal. Uh, the updated school year, obviously the 2020-2021 school year. There was some language that had been updated that April Camuso had covered in her presentation that also goes along with ours. Um, as far as the health and nurse information. And these were COVID-19 related um, updates that needed to be added to the language, um, especially around medication, um, time of um, kids being out, going from 12 hours to 24 hours. Um, and those were very minimal tweaks and you can see those on pages 16 through 18. The changes that I really had to look at for myself were the time of arrival. I'm sure if you noticed, um, some people have been able to drop off their in-person students. We had to adjust things to um, make that a little bit more seamless and to allow for social distancing and making sure that we weren't mixing cohorts. So uh, traditionally what we had done was we, I had had a staff member who opened up uh, the cafe and invited children who were dropped off a little bit earlier um, at 815 because we were still working on that before care uh, program. So we did have someone who was in the cafe who would allow our drop off students to come in um, 
at 815. We are no longer doing that this year because of all the reasons that are related around making sure that we're not mixing cohorts and that we're also not asking staff to watch students prior to school. So we've changed our arrival time from 815 to 820. Um, and then we've allowed children to come into each individual hallway that they've been assigned so that we're making sure that we're spreading children out and making sure that they get into the, to the school as safely as possible. Our bus students still arrive at the same time and enter through the front door. So that's why we had to change the time from 8.15 to 8.20 due to our supervision and also due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and so that's the only big change as far as time of arrival. Also with dismissal, we asked families, and everybody has been very supportive of this, if there are gonna be changes to your child's plan, especially for our in-person students, that you contact the office before 11 o'clock. And we just simply asked this so that we are able to coordinate all the pieces that I just spoke about, making sure that if, if there's a child that needs to be dismissed, we're mindful that we're not asking adults to come into the building, but we then escort that child down to someone who can um, escort them out of the building safely, making sure that we're maintaining social distancing and that the child gets where they need to be. Now, obviously there are emergencies and things happen. I'm a parent, I get that. Um, and sometimes we will get that phone call right before the, the child gets on the bus and somebody's begging to hold them back and have them be a, a parent pickup. We understand that that's gonna happen, but for the most, we ask that at 11, before 11 o'clock, be mindful that we'd like to have any changes to the student's day be communicated directly with the front office. We also don't want notes to be sent in because we want to make sure that teachers are kind of cohorted and staying with their students. We don't want the added responsibility on the teachers to be walking the hallways and trying to deliver things to the front office. So we ask that families email us. If they're not able to email us, they can call us, of course. So that's the only uh, um, addition for um, notes and changes in dismissal. We also had updates, um, April Camuso touched upon the training that Dr. McKenzie, myself and April uh, went through for our Title IX. And so we added the language that's current and updated from, our, um, from our, the district training that we attended. And so that can be found in the document as well. Our attendance policy, has also the addition of the attendance policies will apply to both in-person and remote learners for the school year. So we wanted to recognize that there are a percentage of students that are now remote. And so our attendance policies have just been um, updated to reflect both that there are both remote learners and in-person as well. Those are all the current updates to the handbook. I am able to take any questions that you might have. No questions from me. Do folks have questions? No questions. Seems pretty straightforward. Great. Okay, and this is an action item in terms of approval um, of the handbook for Hadley Elementary School. Uh, if there are no questions or clarifications needed, is there a motion for that approval? Yes, so moved. Second. Second. Sorry. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Okay. It is approved. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Jen. <laughs> uh, okay, going back to rates, uh, we're going to switch back to the pre kindergarten rates. Annie? Yeah. yeah, so I'm also going to allow Ms. Winner to, I can do some explanation of the rates, but I'm gonna allow Ms. Winner to take us through some of, or Ms. Dowd to take us through some of the changes to the Hadley, um, the preschool kind of handbook and things that you had updated, um, Ms. Winner or Ms. Dowd. And part of that, the rates are in there. So if at any point I need to provide clarification on the rates, I'm happy, I'll jump in and do that. Who wants to do that? I can take some changes, Miss Dowd. If you don't mind just sharing the screen for me, I'm not not I'm at keep it all. Out on that. 
Kathy. And I would have to say that I really appreciate Ms. Winner's um, participation in trying to update the handbook, um, given that today was the first day of preschool. Yes, good job, um, Ms. So, Winner. Um, we she it. had a lot on her plate, <laughs> and I just appreciate her um, doing a lot, and it was wonderful to see the, the littlest students come in today. So let me get that up for you. Yeah. Um, preschool. Here we go. Right. Can everyone see that? Yes. Right. So much the same as um, Ms. Dowd had said for the elementary handbook, some of our things were just changed to make more sense for this year um, due to things being different from COVID. Um, one of the first things, our payments are generally due on the 15th of each month. Obviously, we wouldn't ask for our families to pay when their children just arrived today. So we've tried to bump that date out and we had um, thought that the 30th might give enough time for people to be able to do that. Um, we've also updated some of the language to include both in-person and remote learners for our time. We have children participating in both programs right now. Um, We've also added some things that the town hall for years has been asking that I remind families we thought it would be a good idea to put it into the handbook so that everybody's aware. Checks being written in blue or black ink, it seems like a really simple thing, but um, when someone writes it in red ink or purple, it won't be read by the machine. So we're trying to um, give parents a very nice place to have all of that important information. So we have updated that as well. Um, so that will all be on the, the first page here. Do you mind just scrolling down, Jen? Sorry, <laughs> thank you. We've included um, the updated rates in here as well. Normally, a preschool schedule, families have a choice of anywhere from two to five days per week. We usually have a half day, which is an 11 15 pickup, a lunch bunch group, which is a 12 15 pickup, and a full day option, which runs until 2 45, 3 o'clock. There's a window for families. Um, obviously, this year, in aligning with the reopening plan, we won't be going until 2.45 or 3 o'clock. We'll be going until 1 o'clock. So we have added in what we've called the long extended morning, which will run until 1 p.m. So we've adjusted rates to um, meet that need for families. So they're not having to pay for the entire day if their child is not with us for the entire day. Um, and I don't know if you'd like to speak about those rates, Dr. McKenzie, or... I would just say, I imagine that school committee might ask if um, there was any increase to the rates. There were no increases to the rates. It's just people pay, would pay more. So the, the morning rate and the full day rate are the same as they were in fiscal year. What fiscal year are we in right now? We're in 21. They're the same as they were in fiscal year 20 last year. Um, but we just added these two additional tiers and the changes, the how much one pays also depends not only on how long you stay, but how many days per week they access the program. Thank you. So we can scroll down to the next. Um, in looking over the handbook, I've noticed that there was no language around our programs that we have, um, such as half day, and now what we're calling the short extended morning, which is our 1215, typically called lunch bunch, but this year, um, obviously it's a little bit different. So I've added language. Um, to let families know what their child's, what they can expect their child to be doing during those times, what their program will include. Um, there's language around the full day program, but we've added it for the half day program, the short extended morning, and the long extended morning. So families will know what is happening for their child during those times. We can scroll down, thank you. Um, and one thing that was changed in the full day program, um, this has been happening for years, but now there's just changing some language. Instead of mats being sanitized weekly, they are actually sanitized daily after each child uses them. So I wanted to make sure to update that. Um, and then the other things that were changed, um, our student drop-off procedure and our student pickup procedure. During a normal year, we would have families bring their child into the building this year to limit exposure. We are having families bring their children to the parking lot and a staff member is going out and escorting the children into the door. The same is true for the afternoon um, pickup where we will bring the children out for their families. Um, 
We've also changed our health policy and the visitor policy to align with what the elementary school has. So that would be the same. That way there's consistency for everybody. Doing both of those. That's about it. <laughs> Any questions? Great. Thank you. I know when I read this, I was just struck by, I, I appreciate the flexibility that's been implemented here in terms of the different pricing structure to really give, um, you know, options for families that may, it may or may not, you know, have different time frames in mind. So that's, that's appreciated to be able to kind of clearly see what each of those have in terms of a um, tuition dollar impact. Thank you. I should clarify for families in case they're wondering that those, those, the tuition, if a family opts to be remote, preschoolers have the option of being in person. If they opt to be remote, then and participate in the program, they still would pay tuition. So the tuition is not, if you participate in the program, um, there are expenses associated with having a program. And because in-person is an option, um, uh, parents would, that rate, there is no different rate for somebody who says that they're going to be remote. Okay. Any other questions? No, thank you. And I agree with you, Heather. It's nice to have that flexibility, the different options. Great. Ms. So Winter, thank you very much for doing this this evening. Mm -hmm. And thanks to your children for putting up with it also. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. This does require approval um, for the pre-K rates for fiscal year 21. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed or abstain? All right. It is approved. Thank you very much. Thank you both. <laughs> Thanks for joining Thank us you. this morning. Thank you. All right. Next, uh, we have COVID-19 mobile testing response units. Every time yes. I see this, I think of the Saturday Night Live one-man mobile uplink, but I know that's not yeah. what it is. <laughs> so... Uh, so these are also documents that um, there's a link in the slideshow. Again, I will send out all of these documents a second time in the newsletter. They are all um, public. So this is just uh, a little overview of what these mobile testing response units are, the process for one coming to the school, under what conditions would they come, and what's important is that people understand what that might look like. Uh, so. First is, let me try to work this probably first, right? Um, so how does it work? The district is the first thing that's going to happen and this will really happen through the nurse's office. So if we find out that a staff member or a student has tested positive for COVID-19, it doesn't matter. Some people have asked, well, it doesn't only matter if, if you find that out in school or if it happens in school. First of all, I remind folks, there's no way no one knows where, if, if they test positive for COVID, there's no way to know, did that happen at the grocery store? Did it happen? Where did it happen? So as soon as we know that a case is positive, staff or student, then um, we, the school nurse calls, this is in addition to contacts that the school nurse may make with Department of Public Health or Board of Public Health. The school nurse calls the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education's Rapid Response Center. This is a dedicated phone line just to get information on positive COVID cases. This, the intake specialist at DESE logs this information into a tracking system, not first name, not last name, simply logs staff, student, and uh, the district and, and school is what they care about. Then the department is going to monitor this tracking system several times a day and will contact the school, in this case the school nurse, within 24 hours and provide information on next steps. So when might a mobile testing unit arrive? In a classroom, if within a 14-day period two or more individuals in a classroom test positive and classroom transmission is suspected, a mobile testing unit may be deployed to test all individuals in the class, including the adults associated with that class. That who, the question, a logical question is who decides if classroom transmission is suspected? The nurses communicate with Department of Public Health, Board of Health, 
and with the um, dedicated resources at the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. I don't decide that. Uh, if in a grade within 14 days, three or more individuals in a grade test positive and transmission is likely and transmission likely occurred in the school, the mobile testing unit may be deployed to test all individuals in the grade, children and adults associated with that grade. And in a school, if within a 14 day period, 3% of the school test positive and transmission likely occurred in the school, the mobile testing unit may be deployed to test all individuals in the school. And what does that, oh, and on a bus. Same thing, 14 day period, two or more students on the same bus, test positive and transmission likely occurred on the bus. The MTU may be deployed to test all the individuals on that bus. So how do we prepare for this? We should let the community know what we're doing now. Um, and I will again, continually to provide information in the newsletter that this is how it works. This is when it's deployed. And um, this is what it looks like. So the nurse, if in fact, in that communication with Jesse, remember I said every single case that's positive, we call the department, the department's calling us back. The department also works with DPH and says, um, yeah, we think that that transmission may be occurring in your classroom grade school or on your bus. So we're going to deploy a mobile testing unit. Nurse contacts Department of Public Health, conversation Department of Public Health ultimately decides. So it isn't just the school nurse gets to call and request. It's, a, it's collaboration, DPH ultimately decides if the mobile testing unit will be deployed. We notify the school community that a mobile testing unit is going to arrive at the school and the nurse notifies the eligible individuals who will be tested when the mobile testing unit arrives. You see a picture of an ambulance because that's what it will look like. So people should be prepared for the fact that um, when the mobile testing unit comes, it'll look like there's first responders and ambulance in front of the school or around the school to, uh, to um, the mobile testing and uh this is a link that again as i will send out again for people they can access all of the information the multi-page documents that explain under what conditions what it looks like and the criteria for having a mobile testing unit arrive so this is not an action item but it was just part of the preparation is letting the community know what it is when it's deployed and what it looks like when it arrives And that's it with that, I think. Thanks, Annie. Any questions from folks? I'm slightly concerned about the visual indicator of people seeing an ambulance on, uh, outside the school. Um, but I, um, the, the, on one hand, it, it could be a visual indicator that, you know, we're taking proactive steps and it's probably just a, a COVID test to be cautious. And then on the other hand, I wonder whether uh, it's prudent to sort of respect privacy and have it parked in the back. And um, I don't have an answer for that, but that's what comes to mind when I see an ambulance is that it's a small town and people are going to, word will spread super fast, so. Well, and often so, there is messaging kind of um, sometimes to the public when there is, a, you know, an incident or some and some event at the school would there would there be any kind of yes messaging yes. without any yeah. specifics yeah. necessarily yes uh so even for um positive cases in and i certainly when i say this do not expect anyone to remember this or to remember where it is because i wrote the plan and i don't remember where it is but i can assure you that even within the plan um, there's a whole, the whole section on protocols, which you can find in the table of contacts. Within that section, you can link to the notifications, what it looks like, actually what I will be sending home to parents, even just under suspected cases. We would never uh, disclose any identifying information because we also recognize that we don't want people to get misinformation and start to get alarmed and afraid. So yes, there would be messaging that went out via our school brains emailing system. And um, typically, yeah, typically I, I 
that is that would be an email. I usually reserve phone calls for school is closed. Um, so or or you have to come get your child. But yes, there would be messages and some of those notice notifications already sitting in the plan. People can see the template for what they can expect to receive. Any other questions or comments? I hope we don't need it, but I'm glad we are prepared. Um, <laughs> I have a question. Will, is the select board going to be notified in case in your plan, Annie? So I generally notify, if you're saying if the, if the mobile testing unit were deployed or, yes. yes. So anytime I send out messages, like this any anything unusual so if we see if it's not a fire drill but if there's public safety anything unusual i try anytime i send those out to cc the select board so i send it over to the town administrator and i then forward it i forward those parent messages to the entire select board because i know that people can call town hall asking what's going on right so just like i do with the newsletter i always try to forward all those messages to the select board and town administrator as well thank you we think you're doing a great job Oh, well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks, Jane. All right. If there are no other questions, this was uh, just a presentation discussion mm -hmm. item, so no action needed. Thank you very much for covering that. Um, superintendent and district goals is next. Yes, so here we go. Another screen here. Oh, I'm just getting really good at this. So I uh, hope that I inter incorporated feedback from the school committee. I will remind you that the general things kind of on the first page are longer term. They're aligned directly with standards and indicators. That's to facilitate your ability to evaluate me because by law, you have to evaluate me on very specific standards and indicators um, that the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education determines. Uh, and then, but on the activities for this year, Let's go here. So hopefully I captured what was critical to you. And if I didn't, just give me feedback and I can bring it back on October 1st. Um, so under instructional leadership, one of our priorities will be uh, making sure that we are implementing instructional practices that support high quality and engaging remote learning. I know that's a priority for the school committee and for our community. And um, the school committee has appreciated, it seems to me, survey data feedback from families, from students. So we're committed to making sure that we are reviewing the impact of our instruction on student achievement and engagement, not only through assessments, but also through surveys and other qualitative feedback measures. We would share those with the school committee making sure that we evaluate our policies, practices, curricula, school and district culture for implicit bias and identify evidence-based interventions to address racism, bias, and explicitly teach anti-racism. Implement our innovation pathways in business and finance and life sciences and monitor the achievement and engagement of initial student cohorts. This will be year one of implementation. A similar goal for early college high school and then if opportunities for funding become available to apply for additional high quality college and career pathways to include engineering and technology, the arts and public safety or health professions and prepare, prepare for our project lead the way launch, which will be next school year. We would prepare this year and implement next year. Um, the research select and implement a framework that expand, enhance and evaluate practices that support diversity, equity and inclusion. I provide an example here. I'm not saying that's what we would use, but to have an actual framework to evaluate these practices and to see the extent to which we are making diversity, equity and inclusion a priority. Foster positive labor relations. Um, implement our district reopening plan. So I'd heard last time, which I appreciate the school committee acknowledging just the plan implementation is a pretty heavy lift. So to implement that with fidelity and monitor the effectiveness of our mitigation strategies and provide regular updates to the school committee and community. Track and report on efforts to diversify our workforce and secure grant funding to expand programs and increase available resources for teaching, learning and effective operations. Uh, collaborate with our community groups to implement anti-racist practices, curricula and policies in the district. 
survey our families and students regarding COVID-19 response in remote and in-person learning instruction and learning and uh, recruit teachers to participate in meaningful decision-making teams at the building and district level and provide educators and staff with the resources and materials and professional development to design high quality instruction in remote in-person and hybrid learning environments so again i am open for feedback if i am missing things that you had mentioned that were critical for the school committee that you would like me to focus on this year Yeah, I, I read through these and felt like they really did address um, the feedback and the acknowledgement of, you know, the situation that we're in uh, now. Um, and I appreciated you, you know, infusing that in there, given the work, you know, and the undertaking that that is in itself. Not a problem. Well, that feedback was very clear, so I appreciate that. That was, and I did this in collaboration with the leadership team, so they helped to draft it because they'll use that to have conversations with their school councils and as a springboard for also making sure that their school strategy documents align with the district strategy documents. I think this looks good, Annie. I don't have any edits, any comments. Yeah, I agree. I think it covers everything that we talked about um, in terms of the priorities for this coming year. Great. This is something the school committee does need to approve. Um, yep. Yeah, action item for um, approval of district and superintendent goals. Uh, is there a motion for that? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstain? Okay, great. And Tara, are you, um, I haven't heard from you yet. I just want to make sure you're able to see and hear and interact with us. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm nodding my head and, and oh, there I'm you are. motioning approvement in my eyes, yeah, but I didn't have any. <laughs> you did ask a question earlier. Now I'm all remembering. Okay. now. <laughs> my bad. All right. Next. Um, In-person enrollment for the first six weeks. Uh, uh, so, this, yeah. These numbers we put together, um, they may have changed slightly, right? So some people are kind of like, some folks have, have joined us for in-person. Um, so some, there's a little bit of adjustment, but overall you can roughly see we have about 123 students total in the district, roughly 76 at Hudley Elementary and 47 at Hopkins Academy. Um, so I am really, really grateful to our faculty, and our staff. I just can't emphasize this enough. Um, we are blessed, not only with people who are dedicated, committed, doing, doing really great work in circumstances that are new and different. Um, there are many districts where they haven't even sorted out when, if how, people are returning. So, our staff have been working hard on deck since day one of professional development, doing a phenomenal job with uh, students, interacting with families, trying really hard to have all kinds of orientations and ways to engage parents, ways to engage kids. Uh, Hopkins had some um, their crazy week, like a first week spirit week this week to try to kick off the school year to a positive start. So. Just a big, a huge thank you to our, our faculty and our staff. Just incredible what they're pulling off and to our families for working with us because not everything has gone off perfectly. We know that, it's far cry from that. We've had our glitches and we've had our moments and families have been patient and they've been kind and they've presumed positive intentions. So it's been great. It's been delightful to see children in buildings. I didn't realize how much I missed them and I missed it. And the adults in the buildings are saying that to a person, just what joy it is to have children in school. Um, it's delightful. So we hope and we should see in our data, God willing, things keep just plugging along um, and we hope to keep, keep moving forward. So it's been good.
Thanks, Annie. And so those numbers reflect um, where we are now in person yep. enrollment for six weeks. Um, mm -hmm. And one of the things that I know, you know, we've talked about a little bit, and maybe you could just speak to here in terms of those numbers may be impacted by folks either um, choosing to come into uh, in person during during that time or uh, folks who kids who are become part of one of those groups that is able to meet face to face uh, during that six weeks. Can, can you just speak a little bit to that for, for Thank us? you. Thank you, Heather. I'm so glad you remember you reminded me of that. So that's really important important for parents to understand because um, one could become eligible right things can change and for all kinds of things can change right um, income eligibility all kinds of things can change needs of a student right so um, these things are not it's not you had to have been eligible your student had to have been eligible by this date and that was the only entry point if you are uh, and if, if a family has any question about whether or not their child is eligible for in-person learning, please email or call your principal. So if you have any question, don't hesitate to ask, email or call your principal. And there is no question that is silly, so because eligibility can change. So please reach out to us. Thanks, Annie. So yeah, while we voted on the populations that are part of the, those eligible groups, the, the fact as to whether a, a child or family are eligible is something that can change given mm -hmm. circumstances um, and otherwise throughout the school year. Right, it's not like a pre-existing condition. It's something that we should constantly, constantly be looking at. Mm -hmm. And so stay in touch with your principals and, yep. uh, and your superintendent. Yes, please. So Annie, these, the 123, those are the that's enrolled. So those are the children that have shown up this week. Roughly. Yes. And there's well, been some adjustment over the last four days too. I know a student just joined us today at one of the schools, which was great to, to see them. As a matter of fact, I might have forwarded uh, something to you all. So we had a student just show, just they initially thought it was an eligible population, thought they were going to do remote, and then it wasn't, it wasn't working for the family. And so that, that student joined us today. It was wonderful to see the person. And, and we shouldn't necessarily call it enrolled, right? Because I have three kids who are um, all catching in remotely. They're all so our attending in person, quite yeah. substantially larger. Um, yeah. But I do want to add that um, you know, four days into the school with three children uh, catching in remotely, I've been uh, really impressed um, and um, heartened and um, just amazed at our uh, teachers uh, and our educators and how much effort they put into um, being organized and being um, on top of where their students are. And um, I have um, a very self-directed child and two, you know, one not very self-directed child. And it's just amazing how um, our educators are so um, kind, gracious, and um, find a way to engage the learners. Um, so I've been thrilled with what I've seen. Thanks, Humara. Here, here. <laughs> I echoed that for the for everyone uh, that has helped to make that happen. All right. Um, are we good to move to remote learning technology essentials grant notification? Yes, and I can actually speak to both of the grant notifications. The enclosure was just the letter, so I want to announce that, yes, we did receive roughly $36,000 to assist us with some additional technology pur uh, purchases. We're grateful that that was awarded from the state. We also received um, our implementation funding for implementation of innovation pathways, and I anticipate I've submitted a request, a proposal for implementation funding for our early college implementation. So I anticipate that when it's, when it's formal, I will announce that to the school committee. I want to say, I should know right off the top of my head and I'll have better figures for you next time, but I do feel as though for competitive grants, I think 10 weeks in, we might be close to $178,000. So we're doing well, that's competitive. That's not entitlement. Entitlement's probably um, another 
I don't know. I'll get it for you next on October 1st. I'll have all the, the I'll have a grant update for you. So Annie, just thinking about the remote learning technology grant, um, what are some of the things that come to mind in terms of areas where that may um, may help to support or enhance our our technology plans? So they're pretty specific. We said this is what we'd like, and they said, okay, you can use. I, I, I mean, I'll be honest. I asked for a lot more money than that, but I'm grateful to the state for anything that we get. <laughs> I asked for a whole bunch more. So we'll use this funding to uh, pay for the what are these called Chromebook convertibles for our second graders. I think we're doing Chromebook convertibles. Um, so it's a tablet and a Chromebook, both or combined uh, for some hotspots, mobile hotspots. Uh, I think there are three mobile hotspots perhaps, Chromebook convertibles and maybe we'll have money left over for iPads as well. Again, I asked for many things. Um, but I think with the $36,000 are Chromebook convertibles, additional iPads, and mobile hotspots. That's, That's great. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any questions or comments on the grants? Just great work by you and your team, Annie. Good job. Yeah, thank you. A lot of help from the faculty and staff on this innovation pathway in early college. That work. So grateful for it. Thank yeah, you. congratulations. All right, review of public health data. All right. So this is our first really... uh, review given yes. the metrics that we talked about last time and voted on. Um, and we've gotten them pulled into a nice dashboard. Right. We hope. <laughs> Let's make sure that. Well, where's my groovy chart? Oh, there it is. I was going to say, goodness gracious. Um, all right. So. What do we have here? The school committee and Tara or anybody jump in if um, I'm not, uh, if I don't, if I misspeak here. But we talked about in terms of the things that the school committee would be looking at. Um, the school committee is looking at two things, primarily evidence of community transmission and evidence of school transmission. We have no evidence of school transmission at this point. We don't have cases in the schools. Um, in order to evaluate community transmission, the school committee had decided that they would look at average daily incidence rates in Hampshire County uh, because we wanted a large enough population sample and uh, testing positivity rate. And on the average daily incidence rate, we were using uh, Harvard Global Health had put together kind of a a way of evaluating um, average daily incident rates. And that if they were less than one per 100,000, really there's everything, there's really nothing happening. Everything's great. If you had cases between, between one up to nine per 100,000, that at that point you should be, have mitigation strategies in place. Um, but it doesn't mean that we have to, we have to shut things down. It just means that we should be that transmission could occur and that we need to be implementing uh, our mitigation strategies with consistency and fidelity, I should say. When you start seeing orange and red, so 10 to 24 cases per 100,000 or greater than 25, of course, if we were over here, more than 25 per 100,000, I imagine we'll be hearing from the state at that point. It probably would look a lot like last spring, um, but uh, if we are, 10 to 24, then um, there's certainly evidence of community transmission. And so where are we? These data are taken directly from the DPH dashboard that we looked at the last couple of meetings together. That dashboard is on like page three of the district plan, the link to it. So you can always get to it very easily. Families can look at this on their own. It's published every Wednesday by 6 p.m. It's on the Department of Public Health's website. You Google in COVID-19 dashboard, mass DPH, it's gonna bring you right to it. You click on the weekly dashboard. The blue up here, that's Hadley data. And we said Hadley's population is large enough for us to, to look at average daily incidence or testing positivity. However, we said we wanted to pay attention what is happening in our local community. So these are, 
all of the dates for which we have data, right, since school has started, they have data from before that. Um, and total case count, case count in the last 14 days. You can see the most recent one. Uh, there was zero in the last 14 days in Hadley. That's quite promising. Now the lavender columns up here, these are Hampshire County data, right? So average daily incidence rates per 100,000. They were at 2.8, 3.3, 2.3 in this past uh, report. They were down to under one, so that's fantastic. That's that green area in Harvard Global Health. That is great news for Hampshire County. Um, the testing positivity rate, um, you can see has remained, has decreased since last week and has remained under 1%. We want that no greater than 3%. And the graphs to show the trends of those data, um, both for testing positivity and average daily incidence rate. Thanks, Annie. So I think, um, you know, given this, as of today, you know, we are still then on track for our six week, you know, plan that we talked about in terms of then moving to the next phase as of today. Yeah. And Annie, I, can I, yeah, of I just, I, uh, because I was looking at this data earlier, that testing positivity rate, mm -hmm. I'm just like picking nits here, I apologize. Um, on um, September 2nd, you have the test positivity rate of 0.85%, and it's actually 0.38%. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. 0.85 is, is the, the county right below us, so. Thank you. Well, there you have it. Thanks, the good Ethan. thing that people can uh, get this data themselves. <laughs> this is why you know, we want people. To the other to thing I was going to mention, um, not that this is uh, just because it came up in a prior discussion around colleges and testing and what you know transparency we would have. Um, it was announced yesterday that each Wednesday that COVID-19 weekly public health report that's published each Wednesday will include a report on the number of tests performed, co positive cases, percent positivity, and the percent of new cases identified through testing by public and private colleges and universities. Um, as well as, you know, as additional colleges launch their efforts, they're gonna add those to the report. So just more um, information for folks in case they are looking at this data um, and are you know concerned about the impact of uh, or what colleges are doing? Um, we did you know talk about that at a prior meeting, so I wanted to mention that that transparency that that will be part of the Wednesday reports that the state releases. The uh, charts. I am terrible at building charts in Google Sheets. The charts came from Excel, so I'll make sure I correct the charts. That's why the charts aren't updating. The charts are in an Excel workbook, so I'll update that, and then the charts will be updated. Thank you for catching that, Ethan. So this is great news, and I just want to thank folks in the county and folks in the community. This doesn't happen without people uh, doing, being vigilant about what they need to do, which is socially distance, wear masks and uh, you know, wash their hands and do what they need to do. So this doesn't happen in a vacuum. It doesn't happen by accident. We have a lot of influence and control over um, our own safety, health, and well-being. And so folks are doing what they need to do. Our students have been fantastic. Our staff have been fantastic. A big thank you to our students. I know it is not fun to sit around in a mask at school. They've been great. They've been great. I, you know, there were a lot of folks who speculated, oh, young people will never do this, um, but they do, they're smart and they know. And when you do, when you take those steps, this is what we see and I'm grateful for that. So, and when we see this, schools get to open and that is all I am holding my breath for, right? Entirely open. So yes. Annie, too, on that, just to follow, I was, I was gonna ask how it's going the last few days. So it's good to hear that things are going well. I'm sure there's a lot of lessons to learn. Mm -hmm. So. Also, you know, we had committed that we weren't going to allow anybody in until we had the HVAC up and running and air purifier. So mm -hmm. any updates on those things? I know those are done, yeah. but we haven't talked about it in a while. Yes. Yeah, so uh, purifiers, we have that. HVAC, um, we had a good report on HVAC after all the cleaning happened, disinfecting, the repairs of the system. We're going to keep um, 
investing in improving the system. So the system is functioning well, but the town has been incredibly generous with allowing us to access the CARES funding for the town. And so we can um, continue to even do more improvements around heating, ventilation, uh, heating and ventilation and air conditioning in the buildings. So that is going well. And, and there that, are, the sorry, go ahead. And that allowed us, the CARES Act money allowed us to purchase the air purifiers that are in. Yeah, the thank room. you, Tom. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Tom. Very, very grateful for the select board, town administrator and public safety in supporting that request. And we will, I'm saying things, I, I feel like things are going extremely well. And we also recognize, let me say again, the families are saying, well, geez, I had trouble logging on. Like we know that there are glitches. We want to improve that. We also know that our almost 100% of our emphasis, which is probably why people had a lot of conversation around, ah, I'm not hearing exactly what the instructional practices will look like. Our emphasis was on safety. We wanted to have the option for children to attend school in person who wanted to do that and reduce risk. We wanted to make that as safe as possible. So now we're learning what's working and what's not working in terms of the educational experience, like kids who are learning remote in person. And so before we move to the next phase, we're not gonna recommend any major changes, like no changes to mitigation, no changes to how much time parents can expect as we move through phases for schools to be open. But what this the schedule looks like for students during the day, what that experience looks like. The reopening team is meeting, I don't know, next week or the week after. We're gonna really make sure we start getting feedback from students from the faculty about are there things we could do differently to make this a more engaging and enjoyable experience. We're so we really were focused on getting safe and staying safe and we're gonna keep that as a priority and and continually continually try to enhance things, make things better for kids and teachers. So we'll keep coming back to this dashboard um, mm -hmm. and build on this and um, appreciate you putting it in you know the one one visual that's clear to clear to see. Can I ask just before we move on, and Annie, you may already be doing this, and thank you for putting together the um, the Excel with the table and the charts. That's helpful. And um, I'm just, I know that there was an email about communicating some of this stuff. Can we include that in the newsletter? Like includes, include our metrics, how what we've decided on in the sure. newsletter, include the update on um, mm -hmm. the HX and the safety and everything in our newsletter just for parents who aren't able to attend or read meeting minutes or whatnot. Sure. And then also maybe just have the link for the um, DPH website right in there too. So that oh, way yeah. they can just, because I know it can be hard to navigate that site. Just to yes. have handy. Yes. Um, Thank you. I am putting a to do note in my calendar for tomorrow. I'm not sharing my screen right now. Am I? Well, if I am, the all can see my calendar. No, you're not. But, okay. <laughs> so, not that it's that exciting, but so. I think Paul just had to drop and he is dialed in. Okay. I'm um, just trying to make sure he's able to unmute as he needs to. Reopening updates. Okay. Yes. Someone may need to, um, as the host, be sure that the the number ending in four five nine eight is able to unmute as they can. So Paul can talk to us. Okay. All right. All right. Anything else on the review of the public health data? Uh, no, just not for my end. Okay. All right. Um, the flu vaccine requirements. Just a reminder for families. So this is now regulation from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education for all students, just like there are vaccine recommendations. Again, what Mass Department of Public Health recommends for all families every year, that is a hyperlink within the reopening plan. Um, so if people are wondering where is that, you can always contact your school nurse if you are unsure. I also believe you can find it under health services on our district website. 
and you can find it in the reopening plan. The flu vaccine requirement is a new requirement this year. So all students enrolled, and the department has said even students who are enrolled for remote learning, that that is a required vaccine. Um, and it is not, we, we do not, or we, the regulation does not say that we can uh, mandate staff or faculty to do that. However, I will say that we have flu clinics for our staff next week at both schools. And we always have a very high turnout. Some of our faculty and staff choose to go to their own provider or they go elsewhere, but we do have very high turnout for our uh, flu vaccination clinics that we provide on site. But families just need to know this is not a school committee requirement. It is not a unique Hadley district requirement. This is now a regulation, a state regulation, uh, just like all other vaccines are mandated by the Department of Public Health. Individual school committees do not determine which vaccines are required for school entry. Annie, just because I didn't see it, did they set a, a deadline for when? Yes, uh, the end of the year. I want to say Ju uh, July. <laughs> okay. By January December 31st. Yeah, it's just so by January 1, the end of the calendar year. And I, I understood too that that applied for all enrolled students, whether they yes. were in person or remote. That's correct. Mm -hmm. That is correct. Yep. Okay. And that's the flu vaccine. I just want to be clear about that. There's been a lot of the news about COVID-19 vaccine. This is the flu vaccine that we're talking about. Thanks, Annie. Okay, and Paul is back with us by phone, and I believe you are unmuted. Paul, are you able to say hello? Yeah, can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Okay, Great. thank you. Oh, thanks. All right, our last presentation discussion item is the COVID-19 resolution, which was um, introduced at our last meeting. Uh, Humera brought this to our attention, um, and it, it is something that... Uh, came from a neighboring district uh, within the state and that others within um, other districts have uh, chosen to adopt it in some fashion. So we had asked last meeting that it go um, through just an initial review to make it more appropriate for our district um, and our terminology. And so that has come back to us today for review. Um, Humera, would you like to open up the conversation? Sorry about that. Um, I was on mute. Uh, yes, again, this is um, the, the basic idea behind this resolution is uh, that we know when there is mass and inexpensive testing available to all our students and families, um, you know, a dollar uh, to $3 tests that students can do uh, every day, every other day that uh, you know, schools with a grant could acquire or that community members could easily attain, that we could really be a lot, um, a lot more in control of when, uh, a, you know, a virus might be introduced in, into the community and, and really just be out ahead of any kind of uh, uh, cases or spikes. So um, it just makes a lot of sense to support an initiative that would allow for widespread availability for low cost testing. Right now, the regulations don't necessarily allow that. This kind of test exists already. It's, it, it exists around the globe, it exists uh, in our uh, nation, but they're not necessarily widely available. And if we uh, band together with other uh, school districts and advocate for them to be widely available, then we could, uh, this could really come in handy uh, over the coming year, year and a half, uh, in order to just ensure that we open and stay open. So I, I enthusiastically in, endorse the um, voting for this uh, resolution uh, and supporting our colleagues around the state who um, are leading the charge in advocating for this. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think, um, when you brought it to our attention at the last meeting that it, it seems like um, it would not only be you know an important show of support in terms of our district's uh, needs and, and rights but also a show of support for 
our state's districts. Um, is there any portion of this, Humera, that you'd like to read aloud? We see it on the screen here, but I think, um, I, or I don't, I don't think it's um, especially necessary to um, to to do so. Um, I. It's not especially inspiring um, per se. I mean, if there is a, a passage that uh, strikes anyone as especially um, interesting, uh, I, I highly urge us to, to do that. But I, I just think the basic idea is inexpensive tests, uh, widely accessible, available for our community to deploy for teams going to games, for um, you know, students coming in, you know, if at such time that we're not in a cohort model, uh, you know, all of those things are potentially in our future and more easily accessible if we are able to have tests like these. Yeah. So uh, I'll, I'll just read real quick the, what the resolution is at the bottom there, if you just scroll down. Um, basically, what the, we're uh, requesting is that as part of this resolution, we request that the Commonwealth allocate funding for regular proactive testing for teachers, staff, and students in our schools, that we request the Commonwealth support schools, school districts to identify and procure appropriate testing strategies and supplies, which may include low cost, low sensitivity tests to be used at high frequencies and mandate that the Massachusetts Department of Public Health and local public health departments provide real-time data for decision making, including daily updates on the number and rates of new COVID-19 cases, percent positive tests for COVID and exposed contacts in their districts. Well, I think, I mean, I'm, I'm in support of it. Is there any d dialogue, further dialogue we need to have around? I don't have yeah, any questions. Yeah. Go ahead, Paul. There's just one, just one tweak. I think on the third, whereas, so the first COVID is a little wrong, just a little minor nitpick, right? The, it says the COVID is a highly transmissible virus. The COVID is the disease, the SARS is the virus. Just some, we'd have to treat that. It's caused by a highly transmissible virus. Other than that, I fully support it. It's a great idea. Got it. With that, with that um, accuracy change in the whereas COVID is, um, I think it's that third paragraph, whereas. Yeah, right. COVID I see it right here. Yeah. yeah. COVID-19 is a highly transmissible disease. I, I will change that instead of highly transmissible virus. Yep. Or it's caused by a highly transmissible virus. It's yeah, I, I love this okay. idea, so I think it's great. Yep. Okay. Great. With that change, um, is there a motion to approve the COVID-19 resolution? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstain? All right. Great, thank you. And thanks, Humara, for bringing this to our attention. All right, um, we're gonna move now into some of our uh, regular housekeeping business. So personnel report, Annie? Yes, so we have, and we want to thank folks for their uh, service. We've had some folks who have decided that uh, they needed to retire this year. Uh, Steven Saluzio, a biology teacher at Hopkins Academy. We have hired Nicholas Dowd, no relation to our elementary principal, just happened to share the same last name, as, a, as our new biology teacher at Hopkins. And Pamela Bombardier, a teacher at Hadley Elementary School, also has retired this year. That class is being taught by Koki Mulligetta, and so we're very happy that uh, Koki is one of our on our fifth sixth grade team now. Uh, we have had some resignations from educational support professionals. We're very happy for them. In some cases they have secured positions. Um, uh, in one case a, uh, ESB secured it. Some are going to graduate school. You'll have another updated report. Uh, we had a recent notification of someone who secured a position teaching at a private school. So we're thrilled for them. Um, and that they are advancing their professional goals. Um, and you'll have an additional update 
uh, next, well, we meet on October 1st because we have a, a few other things that um, we've been notified informally of a couple of other changes. And when those are finalized and formal, we'll get more additional information on October 1st. All right, great. Thank you. Chris, I believe it's your turn for the business manager reports. Hey, sorry, I just had to turn everything on here. Hey there. Uh, so, long time no see, by the way. I haven't seen you guys in a while. I know, you've missed all the fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've had plenty of my own, so yeah, I, I don't feel left out, trust me. I know you don't. Um, so we have the really the first expense report. We've closed out FY20, and um, we are now fully on FY21. So you, you have the first expense report here. You know, <clears throat> as with most first expense reports, it's really not all that exciting. Um, and somewhat, I, I hate to use the word incorrect, but there's, there's um, expenses charged to the local budget, which will be um, moved over to some of these COVID related grants that we've received. So um, as we got the bills in, we had to pay them. So we paid them from the local budget. And then as we set up the accounts with the town, we will transfer these over to those grant accounts. So the expenses you see, which are by no means, um, you know, what I would consider higher than normal for this point in time, will actually be decreased as I transfer them over into the grant accounts. So um, it'll actually look a little better than what you see right now. Um, so, I mean, I don't know if anything jumped out at, at anyone there. You know, there are some lines that are slightly above what we've budgeted when you figure in the encumbrances as well. Again, many of those will go down as we transfer the expenses out. So, I mean, at this point, if anyone has any questions, I can certainly answer anything you might have. None for me. Okay. <laughs> I, see, I see a whole lot of head shaking. So, <laughs> um, is it okay to just move on to the, um, the revolving accounts. The grant report at this point in time, we've had no expenses to the grants and because it's so early in the year, a couple of the grant applications just opened up this month. So we haven't even received them all. Um, probably next month I should be able to get them at least on the report, but we'll have the amount that we've been awarded. And I know earlier in the meeting, Anne had mentioned um, kind of coming up with the total for all the grants that we've received. And obviously when I get that report to you, that will have that total. So uh, you'll be able to see it. it. It's a nice looking total, I have to say. So, um, Great. And, and if we go to the revolving accounts report, uh, you can see that. Um, Look at that. Yeah, the lunch is, is looking um, stronger than it has recently. Um, what we've done is we've actually built some lunch expenses into the budget, knowing that every year we uh, have to transfer expenses to our local budget to bring the lunch account back into the positive. And so as a result of that, and also with the extension of the free lunch program until the end of the year, that's actually a big help for the lunch program because what happens now is that we get reimbursed for the free lunch amount, which is about $4 per lunch. Uh, and we're getting about $3 per lunch, you know, when people pay for it. So we're actually making an extra dollar per meal. Um, and what that shows is as I've seen the revenues coming in, it's a much nicer revenue. Uh, you wouldn't think a dollar would make a difference, but actually a, a dollar over $3, that's a 33% increase. So we're looking at, you know, a really nice looking increase there. Um, and there were similar uh, items with the preschool revolving as well, where um, the 391 grant is now over. Uh, so, you know, we, we used to get about $30,000 a year from, from that grant to fund some of the teacher salaries in the preschool, that is no longer in effect. So more expenses will be charged uh, from the preschool program to the regular budget. And um, that has been you know, reflected in this year's budget. So, you know, again, not much of a concern um, in that particular account. 
Um, and then, you know, student activity, I mean, that, that's, it's, it's pretty much probably an average balance that you, um, that you see in that account. In fact, if I look at last year's, yeah, it's, it went anywhere last year from 88,000 to 120,000. So it's, it's pretty much right, right about in the middle there. Um, Hadley Kids, um, so this account is just the re revolving account for Hadley Kids. It does not include the uh, $100,000 gift um, that would be coming from that, um, from that program as well. We have not gotten that yet. Um, so that's just the revolving account. And the school choice balance is higher than typical. Um, as some expenses come in, we've charged expenses from school choice for certain technology related items um, that are, again, COVID related. And you know, any of those that we can't squeeze into one of the grants that we've gotten because we're, you know, our, we can't just put anything to those grants. We have to put what we've allocated for them and they have to be COVID related. So, um, but we've also spent more money and, and charged the school choice. So as the bills come in, that will go down. And we've also budgeted to spend $854,000 this year um, from the school choice account. So, um, you know, it looks healthy. It, it won't be quite that high at the end of the year, but um, you know, right now it's, it's looking good. Thanks, Chris. I, I did want to mention one thing about lunch um, that Annie, you and I talked about when the announcement came out that uh, the free lunch program would be extended um, through the end of this year. We wanted to be sure that families who are eligible, though, for free and reduced lunch services, that they still apply for those services if they are um, if they qualify and they are eligible to still fill out that application because um, it, even though it is free through the end of the year, there are um, broader implications in terms of being able to be um, part of that free and reduced lunch program. Annie, is there anything else you wanna say about that? No, you said it perfectly. We can also assist if uh, families are eligible for free and reduced lunch, if there are other programs for which they're eligible, our, our Food Service Department and other employees in the district are keen to work with families to make sure that we can get them connected to everything for which they are eligible. So please, if you have any question, reach out and um, we'll help you with the, the form and any paperwork you need to do. Thanks. All right, Chris, anything else? I, I really have nothing else. No, not at this time. No questions on revolving from anyone? I'll just say it. Yes, when Chris does the revolving report, no, you've never seen a lunch account look like that when I presented the revolving account. So I'll just say it. <laughs> there will be red on there, I'm sure, when Chris- I'm is sure if Chris is absent and I'm reporting it, so it, yeah. it will not look like that. I'm, I'm pretty confident of that as well, yes. Uh, and I did warn Ann the other day that I was going to gloat about the balance, but then I kind of dialed it back a little bit, so. <laughs> you know, Chris, you did mention um, the amount that we had earmarked in our budget from school choice funds. Uh, and, you know, I wonder whether that might be a good um, number to just maybe even include at the, in the top, not as, more as a reference, just that it is, they are funds that are, you know, we have earmarked them, they are spoken for. Uh, and we may have to add to that um, because we have often had to come back to the committee and ask for additional funds to be, or, you know, bills or things to be paid out of school choice. So it might be a good reminder um, if you don't mind adding that to the revolving I, account report. Yeah, I think it's a great idea, actually. I can just add a row at the top and, and you know, for every one of those accounts, if there actually is something, you know, in any of the others that have been spoken for, I can just put that in there. You know, um, let me just take a quick look. Um, okay, yeah, so the athletic revolving, we actually moved out already the, um, the 17,000 that was for the athletic fields. Um, but that would have been another, I, you know, item that I could have put at the top just to say, you see this balance, but let's not get too excited about it because some of it's already spoken for. Um, right. The other thing is that it's it's actually good to have a balance like this because 
there's so many question marks with the revenues that we'll be getting this year from that program. Um, you know, if homeschool numbers are considerably higher than they were last year, for example, that's less school choice revenue we're going to see, um, or or could could be less school choice revenue if if some of those um, students were choice in. So, you know, having having that balance even with a good portion of it spoken for is certainly going to come in handy at the end of the year. Great. Hey, this is Paul uh, and uh, Heather. I think that's a great idea. And then, Chris, you kind of touched on a question I had. Annie, do we have a sense of what school choice numbers look like this year? All I can do at this point is uh, use the the standard method that I do, which is take out the seniors. Um, I can tell you that we have had an uptick in homeschool applications. Some of those are school choice, so that will hit school choice revenues for this year. And some of those are Hadley residents, which will hit Chapter 70 funding for next year, mm -hmm. um, which is the town funding. So we've, we have not, we, I haven't seen anything, any significant movement in school choice. It's more the, the, the bubble has been around, uh, homeschool applications, which is unusual in our district. It's that that's the uncommon one. We don't typically see that. Okay. Question about the um, lunch grant. Um, can you any explain the rationale for why we got that? I'm not complaining. That's a pretty wonderful thing. But um, I was pretty surprised to see that. Um, can you mention uh, what, how, why that became available to us? Uh, funds for uh, lunch to expand the free and reduced uh, to lunch every to everybody. Lunch. Yeah, so that was not just, that was uh, federal regulation USDA. They decided to expand the program nationwide, I believe. This was uh, the federal government extended this nationwide. I see other people nodding their head too. I think I'm correct on that. Uh, so this, uh, I think this was more of a congressional act, right, that authorized USDA then to expand that program, which is a wonderful, it's fantastic. Um, yeah, so it wasn't unique to Hadley at this point. Uh, this okay. wasn't unique to Hadley. It was, a, it was a good move by the federal government to make sure that families have access to food. So there are many families that uh, rely on us for two out of three meals a day. It's a wonderful thing. I, I now understand that it's, it sounds like it's part of a larger mm -hmm. um, stimulus-like strategy to mm -hmm. help families. Yeah. Got it. Okay. All right. Um, then let's move into our school committee reports and discussion. Um, any updates from the policy committee? I'm going to take this one because it's so I have been the one to say the policy subcommittee would be happy and thrilled to be working at full speed on this. And I have been the one that has said, can I do one thing at a time? So we will re-get policy subcommittee up and running. And the lull in action has been me, although I haven't had a lull in action, but <laughs> the lull in policy action has been because of me. I don't think anybody's clamoring, but uh, we're not complaining. <laughs> forward, I forwarded some things to the group that came from MASC regarding policies that may be impacted by COVID. So, you know, that may be your first plan of attack in terms of things that are more time sensitive. But otherwise, I think um, you guys have always been diligent in marching through the, the district policies and tackling each section. Mm hmm. All right, finance and tri board. Any update there? None. Uh, um, I, so I, I would say, as it as it pertains to the school committee, um, there was there were two things that I that I pulled up. One was there were some conversations around the green laws that are going to be put into place and the impact they may have on future Hopkins Academy renovations. Um, and then the only other thing was there was some conversation around and, and Annie, I know I asked you this earlier about yeah. article six, there was some money that's going to be coming back to the school system at some point. Um, yeah. but I, I don't recall how much it was or why it was coming back. Yeah. So I can now remember why, again, I own this one where Ethan <laughs> diligently said, 
Now let's review what happened at that meeting. And I was like, gosh, I don't remember. That seems a lifetime ago, but, but it was a grant that was misclassified last year. So the, uh, the accounting side of the house on the town side had classified a grant that belonged to the schools in the wrong category. And so they'll make the adjustment and I don't remember exactly. I feel like it was just under $30,000. I was going to say, I think it was around 30,000. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll see that correction. And uh, yes. And then the bit about green initiatives and I'm not sure when the next finance subcommittee meeting is, but as soon as I get that information, I'll pass it along. Great. Thank you. Um, next are fields and the CPA update. I'm not sure whether, Paul, if you're still connected with us. If not, Chris, if you're still on, if you are able to speak to it. Sure, um, I can, yeah. Thanks, um, so it's actually going quite well. There have been bumps in the road. I, I'm not going to, uh, let me turn on the video too. I won't lie about that because, oh my God, I mean, they were digging in the middle of the field and then, oh, there were stumps buried there. So we had to have a change order to dig out all of these stumps and have them hauled away somewhere. I mean, it was just, in the beginning, it was one thing after another where I'm like, oh, this is not, this is not going well. Um, but once we got those out of the way, um, and unfortunately we had the funds to cover all of that, um, they actually um, told me the other day that things are really moving along quite nicely. Um, the weather has, cooperated where, you know, we haven't had heavy rainfall because that really could have put a, no pun intended, but a damper on things because um, you really can't work in that kind of soil when it's mud, you know, it would just, it, it would just be a disaster. So uh, the fact that it's been relatively dry um, has been a help for that project. There were some um, requests from the neighbors to spray down the uh, soil at, at a certain point in time because it had gotten so dry um, that as machines drove over it, it created dust that just the way the wind blows there, it just constantly blew toward people's houses. And um, so, and, and I actually did go outside um, just to, to, you know, to see what it looked like myself. And it was really surprising that they didn't even have to be pushing the dirt. And, and actually there didn't even have to be a machine on the dirt. Um, but just when the wind blew, all of a sudden these clouds of of dust would would fly up in the air. And although you would think that they would dissipate into the air by the time they went the probably four or five hundred feet to the house, they didn't. I mean, it was just it was really surprising. So the contractor had no problem just bringing in water and spraying it down. Um, and uh, as far as I can tell, the the irrigation is being installed this week. Um, the well that we had existing had to be replaced uh, because the equipment was just not capable of producing the gallons per minute uh, that was required by the, um, the irrigation system. That has been installed and um, it's, it, it's all set as well. So, you know, we avoided having any kind of delays uh, from that uh, and it, it's looking good. Great, yeah, and Paul earlier mentioned uh, how the walking path uh, looked and how excellent that is. So good. All right. Um, collaborative, Humera. Yes, so um, the collaborative had a board meeting on August 12th and I wasn't able to attend. I think it's possible that we may have had a school committee meeting that night or around that night, maybe before and after that night. It was around the time we were meeting every day. Probably. Um, <laughs> But I just emailed you their last board meeting minutes along with some highlights, uh, which include the fact that they were also struggling with reopening plans for the schools that they operate. They um, also received CARES funding. They also applied for a payroll protection plan act that's for forgivable for all the staff that they have and they're searching for an executive director. So, um, you know, we think we have it bad, but we're not searching for an executive director. Annie, you're staying. Thank God. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for, for passing that information along. No problem. It's in your inbox, by the way. Great. All right. I think we're on then just to our last two action items, the approval of the warrants. Um, is there a motion for approval of the accounts payable warrants submitted in August 2020? 
So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And I will actually abstain. Uh, and then approval of the warrants submitted in August 2020. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I abstain from that vote as well. All right. Um, that concludes all of our items. Just a reminder that um, we're not going anywhere. We've got lots of meetings. We have four meetings on the books here. Um, October 1st, 530. October 15th at 530. November 5th. 5.30 and November 19th at 5.30. And we will start right at 5.30. We look forward to seeing everybody there. And thank you um, to the public and uh, select board and other representatives who came out tonight. We really appreciate it. Is and there just a, a yeah, well, go ahead. Before, before motioning to move, just a, a, a deep appreciation for the times that we receive a calendar invite that allows us to book that time on our calendar. I just quickly scanned for the calendar to see if that time was blocked and it isn't, which means it's fair game. It could be taken by anyone. Uh, so I, we welcome those calendar invites yeah. with the association. I'll make sure I do that tomorrow morning. I'll set Thank up you. all the Zoom meetings and do that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks. No problem. Okay. Thank you. Um, motion to adjourn. Second. Seconded. <laughs> all in yeah. favor. Bye. Bye. Thanks everyone. Bye, Thank guys. you. Bye guys. Bye. 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 Bye.